are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. Chasers of light to the purveyors of pictures to all of you watching and listening from around the world. This is the F11 Photography Podcast. I am your host, Kevin Deal, along with your other host, Mr. Brandon Gorey. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the F11 Photography Podcast. Yes, we are back. Um, I did an audio-only episode on the Fuji X106, which we'll talk about later in today's episode. But uh, yes, we are uh, still navigating through being on both YouTube and in the Apple Spotify world, uh, trying to get that best balance because uh, two things happened this week. Uh, we released our visual podcast on uh, how to use flash and it was our best youtube video Uh, and then i just for the fun of it decided to release a video uh, uh, technically a audio only pod on the fuji x100 uh, 6 and it's also our best performing audio podcast so yay for us First and foremost, if you have stumbled upon us on YouTube and you're seeing us right now, this is a show. So if you see a topic and it's like, oh, how to color grade or, oh, how to use flash, we do everything in a linear show format. So if you're not tuned that way, just use the slider and fast forward to whatever the main topic is that we're talking about. Uh, For a lot of the people who listen to us, the Uh, traditional podcast types, they love the fact that we're a show. And so uh, that is how we roll. That is what we do. And uh, yeah, we're not going to change. So if you need the short version, uh, go to YouTube Shorts, go to TikTok, go wherever you need to go to consume 30-second media. That's out there. That's just not what we're about. So we want to be very clear about that. So if you do stumble upon this and you go, man, I don't want to, I don't want to spend an hour uh, learning about why I have to use Flash. Well, and you don't have to spend an hour learning about it. You can go somewhere else. And uh, this isn't your 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 YouTube channel or your your podcast uh, that you should tune into because that's not what we're about, right, Brandon? That's exactly right. See, Kevin and I, we like to talk about random shit sometimes, but we also love to go on and on and uh, dive down some holes of photography because. Kevin and I are equally passionate about photography, but we are unequally distributed in that passion between the technical analysis of photographic gear and what makes a great photo versus the more lofty abstract things that 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 render us uh, emotionally impacted by the work that we produce as well. What Brandon just said. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's that's our that's our thing. So um we had uh I, I mentioned that we had a cool episode on natural light and uh we had some cool comments in that episode Uh, i just want to highlight a couple i want to thank uh we had some people write in and say thanks guys great podcast so thank you for that Uh, another one a gentleman from denton texas which is kind of up by where i grew up uh loves our pod another person in there saying they're more of a natural light person but they understand uh, why they need to use flash Uh, we also had somebody uh, write in and say that uh, we're in the wrong decade uh, Flash is dead. So uh, if you're watching this and you're scratching your head and you're looking at your bank account because <laughs> using Flash makes you money, you're just as confused as that, we are. Kevin, that guy, that's a wildlife photographer who said that. <laughs> Man, even wildlife. Yeah, no, I, I, I disagree. I disagree. Wildlife photographers who know how to use their gear are smart enough to know why Flash People who use flash photography make money off flash. So <laughs> that's that's an insult to wildlife. The dude's not setting up his strobe when he shoots bears, man. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I would love to look at his work and and see uh, see his dynamic range compression. Like all of his highlights are all blown out because he had to get the person's skin and you know yeah. properly exposed. It's like yeah, okay, dude, uh, sure. But anyway, 
Uh, thank you to all of you who have written in uh, and talked about uh, why you like our pod. Thank you so much. So, uh, And to the people who don't like our pod, we're so sorry, um, especially to the guy who said that they don't have an hour to listen to uh, uh, have somebody tell tell them why they need to use Flash. Uh, like, I, uh, don't tune in. Yeah, or just learn how to use a slider. Uh, we, we talked about that in the last episode. So the Dunning-Kruger is strong with some. Oh so, all right, uh, let's get to today's sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by Gamut. Are you looking for world-class cinematic video LUTs? Check out Gamut. Whether you're shooting on Sony, Canon, Panasonic, Nikon, DJI, or Blackmagic, their conversion LUTs bring all your footage to the same starting place. That's right, if you're shooting a wedding and one of your cameras is Canon, the other's Nikon, the footage will all end up looking the same. And don't worry, Fuji users, help is on the way. I've actually been in contact with Gamut and they're telling me that they are working on LUTs for Fuji. They also make creative LUTs that are catered toward weddings, commercials, editorials, and YouTube projects. Gamut now also offers movie barcode generators. Want to create your own movie barcode? Well, now you can by using their entirely free movie code barcode generator. Use that generator to build out palettes and barcodes for your films. Go to gamut.io to check out their insanely generous holiday offerings, and I'll leave a link in the description of this pod. This is Andy Pham, and you're listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. All right, we are back. Uh, Welcome to today's episode. Uh, We usually have a very specific topic for you. We're going to be a little uh, different today. We're going to talk about multiple topics like a lot of shows do. They'll do a segment on something, and then they'll do a segment on something else. But the general uh, theme of today's episode is... 2024 photography tech. Some of it is stuff that has been announced and been released. Some of it is stuff that we've pre-ordered and are waiting for it to arrive. And then other stuff is just simply rumors. And uh, we'll talk about uh, one of the ones that I want to talk about first. Actually, I do have something I want to talk about first. And I did an entire episode on this camera. And it is the uh, the camera that rode here on a unicycle while drinking a soy latte and voting for Bernie Sanders. And that is the Fuji X106 <laughs> because it is the ultimate hipster camera. It is. Gosh, it's such a hipster camera. Uh, I've seen that camera used more so on YouTube reviews and Instagram reels than I have actually seen it like put out actual work. You know, it's, it's kind of like the Leica phenomenon where you see... Like is used more so as a prop to take photos of to prove that someone is a tasteful photographer than it actually being used for like a meaningful body of work. So ultimate hipster camera. Absolutely. You know, it's like when you it's like when you go to San Francisco and you go to like Joe and the Juice, which is a nice cafe. And you see some guy with a beanie on. He's got a Leica M6 around his neck. And you're like, what film you got in that camera? And he goes. None. Because <laughs> he's just walking around with it. He's not taking photos of anything. He just has a Leica M6. Well, it's a cool camera, in my opinion. I think it looks nice. Uh, and I went ahead and I pre-ordered one. Spoiler alert. Uh, of course, if you want to hear my uh, more in-depth thoughts on it, I did talk about it in a dedicated uh, pod, uh, audio-only pod that we did. Uh, so why did I get one? So the reason I got one is, in addition to portrait photography, I also shoot street photography. And 35 millimeter is my go-to focal length. We've talked about it uh, on this pod that 35 millimeter, like it's the ultimate storytelling lens. And you know, I've taken 24 to 105s on vacation with me in the full frame world and all that. But when I go back and I look at all my favorite shots, they were almost all taken on a 35 millimeter. So I'm like, well. Why don't you stop being the technical guy who worries about what lens you're using and just like, here's what you have, go do it. And so that's part of the reason I got it. The other reason I got it is when I'm out doing YouTube episodes, I have uh, multiple cameras with me and size is a premium. And this thing has a lot of stuff in it for not a lot of size. The fact that it has internal ND filters and internal IBIS on it to me is very cool. Now, the I think I think I don't. I don't know if all X100s have had internal ND filters, but I know at least the the X105, the V did. 
Um, and so having internal ND filters is something you only get out of cinema cameras. So to have a little pocket camera, a little hipster camera, now I bet you like most people who have X100s don't even know what the ND filter does on it. But <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's a camera that looks solely geared towards street photography, lugging it around in a new place and, and playing around with color functions straight out of the camera. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a, uh, a Coleman, Coleman camping stove, you know? It's not meant to be, you know, in studio. You're not meant to do anything crazy with it. It's not meant to, like, you know, um, produce any, like, really heavy, you know, work. It's meant to be carried around, um, have a lot of, like, color functioning, have a lot of, like, film preset functions, a lot of black and white preset functions. And it's just meant to capture shapes and life as you see it. And it does it really well from what I understand. Yeah, there's a big community of people who use the X100s that they, they put like mist filters on it. They don't want it sharp. They want it to look more like film. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to quite use it that way. We'll see. But uh, I I stayed up late. Uh, Tokyo, uh, the, out of Tokyo, Fuji did their, uh, their X Summit. And uh, it started at like 11.30 p.m. And right at midnight, they announced uh, the X106. And I saw it for pre-order on B&H. And I was like... Uh, 48 hour shipping. I just immediately said buy just to see what would happen. And uh, uh, my order went from back ordered to new order. I don't know what jargon B&H uses, but if I'm lucky, it ships on Wednesday. It'll arrive on Friday. And then I depart for Las Vegas on Sunday, which is seven days from the day that we record this pod. I'm going to the WPPI show. Uh, and I guess I should also say that for those of you listening, for those of you watching, um, I'm going to probably release at least one episode, if not two episodes, from the WPPI show, which Brandon's like, sweet, that gives me some time to like. Thank goodness, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brandon gets a little vacation because we, be we won't be doing a pod next week. Uh, I have a pod on the Canon EOS R5 dropping uh, tomorrow, uh, the day after we record this, and then I have another one on the EOS R8, just my thoughts, uh, which... They're going to be mainly audio-only pods because there's not going to be any visual accompaniment there, but something to hold you all over while I'm gone. And so uh, I'm going to go out to the WPPI show. I already have some uh, interviews lined up with Cheetah Stand and some of our other uh, partners that we we we, uh, we work alongside with uh, with this pod. And so, yeah, I, I doubt I'm going to get Nikon or I doubt I'm going to get uh, uh, Canon to, to play ball because they don't want to talk to us. I'd be like, Psh. be like, so uh, Canon, uh, how do you have a, a, a mount that's a half a decade old and no prime lenses and the L L mount that are uh, L you know, your L series of your RF mount that are wider than fifty millimeters? They'd be like, fuck you, dude. <laughs> well, now that we've said it on air, we we know for sure we're not getting anything from Canon. Ah, uh, they don't, they don't, they don't. They're they're one of the most tight lipped companies out there anyway. But uh, it would all be speculative talk anyway. But we are going to talk about Canon stuff uh, later in today's episode. But uh, if I end up getting that X one hundred six, I will start my review on the spot in Vegas. I will. You'll be you'll be seeing me uh, walking around. I need to I need to buy some hipster clothes uh, for Vegas if I get it. I just need, I need to look like I own X X one hundred six because. I dress like a dad, you know, and I need, I need to dress more uh, hipster-like. You just need to go to the warehouse stalker, uh, warehouse stock section of Walmart clothing where they have all the, like, contractor work clothes, like the Dickies, the Wrangler, and, like, all the car Carhartt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you just need to get yourself some really nice canvas wares that are heavy and droopy with a beanie. No, yeah, yeah, well, definitely with a beanie. Uh, hey, it's going to be in the 50s in Vegas, so I might be able to pull the beanie off, especially if it's in the that's high 30s crazy. at night. Yeah. Uh, so that's one piece of tech I want to talk about that uh, I'm anticipating in 2024. Uh, it may may very well be the camera of the year, not because it's the best camera of the year, but just the, the one that has the most hype behind it. And it, it, I can already tell you, I don't even own it. I've never used it, but I can already tell you as somebody who owns a lot of cameras, it's definitely going to be overrated, but it's going to have some, uh, it's going to have some features I think are going to be cool or I can sell it for a profit because nobody can find it if, if I end up even getting it. So that's so true. Well, wait, 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 is that still on back order in most places? It's well, so, so real briefly, cause I have an entire episode on it and I don't want to like just redo the episode that I've already released, but they manufactured it in Japan and right as the pandemic hit, they're like, oh, 
everybody wants this camera and we can't source the parts for it anymore. So I don't know how many millions of dollars Fuji left on the table, but not being able to make something that's hot. So Fuji's like, well, we can't have that happen again. So they decided to make their own facility in China. And then they mass produced the replacement for the, for the five, the V with the VI, the six, the new one. And so apparently they already made a bunch of them. They're already ready to go and they've already arrived at places, but they can't actually be released till Wednesday. So how many orders they put in versus how many they have ready to go? I don't know what that whole situation is, but apparently they're going to be better and more ready to go than they were last time. So uh, I got I, I, I ordered mine right at midnight. Uh, but I also went through the largest, largest uh, retailer for it, B and H likely. So yeah. I may just have gotten, you know, I, I may have been better off just waking up on a Monday morning and calling a local retailer and be like, Hey man, here's, here's, cause yeah. by the way, it's, it's more expensive. It's like $1,600 whereas the original one was $1,400 and it's made in China versus made in Japan. But when you take into account inflation, uh, from five years ago versus now, it's probably priced right where it should be. Uh, compared to what everything else is doing right now. so Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder, like, obviously B&H being a massive distributor, like, what kind of contract do they have with Fuji, if at all? Like, like okay, you're making this. We want X amount of share of this, like, immediately ready for, like, back inventory so that we can just sell to people. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens with that, uh, but I'm not going to beat that horse because I already have an entire episode devoted toward it. Uh, let's shift focus uh, in our talk to Nikon right now because uh, didn't Nikon release a uh, firmware update for the Z8, which we are now recording ourselves on in crisp 4K 30 frames per second? Yeah, that's actually kind of funny you mentioned that. Yeah, welcome, welcome guys you are being recorded on the z8 and the nikon nikon just released a new firmware update for the z8 it is firmware update number 2.00 from 1.01 this is a big deal because basically what it does is it's taking a lot of the technologies from the z9 and then some and applying it to the z8 so you've got you've got the same sensors the Z9 in the Z8, and now you have a lot of the firmware capabilities that made the Z9 the flagship uh, camera. Um, uh, I'm not going to go over all of them because they're tedious and they're detailed, but I will go over some of the main ones. And the major one that a lot of people have been talking about um, that I have absolutely no interest in because I shoot models and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but a lot of Nikon shooters are like withering 70 year old men with $50,000 of, of, of equipment to go on their Nikon. Just, just say, just say doctors and lawyers. Actually, that's, that's like a, but yeah. So, so what they've added is they've added an auto autofocus feature specifically for birds, which is hilarious because previously they had an autofocus eye capture feature for, um, they had auto eye capture, which is basically anything with an eye. And then they had animal eye capture, which was, you know, remarkably better, you know, for animals, especially, um, you know, uh, if you've got like a 300 millimeter lens and you're trying to move it along sort of an angle, it makes sure to, to keep the eye on the animal. And it, it expects that sort of speed and contrast variation uh, variation as you're going past trees and grasses and rocks and stuff. But remarkably better is the autofocus detection for birds. It's uh, Nikon has taken the shape and just like the, the beak and what to expect with the feathers and the outlinings um, and added that to their firmware for the Nikon Z8. And um, from what a lot of people have been saying on YouTube who are actually like bird photographers, they've been saying they've been able to capture falcons in front of like cliff faces and in, in, in forests and stuff like that. It does an incredible job at uh, capturing birds in mid-flight going quickly in front of obviously like very difficult textures. Um, so are we recording ourselves on the new firmware or abs- have you updated? Well, I, people have said that I look like a bird, but um, no, I actually have yet to update that. That's something I'm doing tonight. Yeah, um, well, I'm glad that you didn't update it right before the episode because let that be a lesson to all of you who are listening and watching is the absolute stupidest time to ever update any firmware ever is right before you have something very important that you need to do with it because if you screw up, you're in trouble. And I've actually heard these horror stories where it's like, oh, man, I was like uh, updating my firmware right before some gigantic paid gig. I always do the gig. And then that night, I'll try to update the firmware and go that route. So And see, yeah, see how that goes. Um, something they've included, which is kind of interesting in their, in their firmware update, is they have a autofocus subject uh, detection and like motion activated trigger. 
So basically, um, you can set different criteria for remote photography where you don't even have to be there and you don't have to be hitting the shutter. It's like an automated thing. So like you can set a matrix between how far away the subject is uh, to the lens um, before it starts recording or takes the photo. It's for video and and photo. So it's like incredibly helpful if you're doing like sports stuff or if you're doing uh, like music video stuff and you kind of want to have uh, a camera where you don't, you know, say you're videoing a one gimbal and you've got another camera. As soon as someone walks into frame at a certain distance, uh, suddenly it'll start recording and capturing necessarily. So that gives you the ability to have multiple cameras set up um, around a specific subject. And when that subject reaches a specific set criteria or threshold of distance or a threshold of movement for that matter, um, they will immediately start recording and capturing. So they footage. basically put your ring camera motion detector. Well, in. Yes. And <laughs> so and it's like, yeah, it's like, it's like yeah. you hear that little ring chime bell on your Nikon Z8 and you're like, Oh, oh it's recording. Yeah. And, <laughs> and to go with that, they've also added, um, I, I'm looking through the menu here. Let me, let me see if I can try to find it. But basically they, they've added a setting where you can actually remote control other, like up to like, it was either 12 or 18 Nikon Z8s at the same time, uh, which is 12 Z8s. Yeah. So, like, you could have, again, like, multiple well, cameras, that, like... I, that'd be great if you have a bunch of tripods set up for when you're shooting a movie. Exactly. Yeah. Or, like, really extensive interviews or, like, say you've got a really, like, dynamic play or... Or, yeah, or just a movie and you just... <laughs> That's like automat that's like an automated movie sequence. Like say you've got a whole like house scene and instead of like tracking with a single camera, you could literally just have someone walk through a hallway and you've got all the different angles set up, you know, from the bathroom shot to a hallway, you've got the full hallway shot and just by virtue of someone walking past a number of cameras, you've got a collection of shots, almost like an AI generated sequence of shots and you only need to do that like once. You hear that collective sigh of relief from Burbank, California? <laughs> <laughs> the entire industry is about to be transformed into Nikon users. That's crazy, dude. Like, I, I love that. Um, and something else is actually they, they updated, which is really interesting. This is, this is kind of huge, um, especially for landscape photographers, is they've got pixel shift. And so what pixel shift does is you stack... Uh, you stack four images on top of each other. The low end is four. The high end is 32 images. And basically, when you take a singular image, your pixel for pixel data uh, in the in the subsampling, the RGB channels in each pixel are not going to be fully accurate. This this is one of those times where I get to flex and go. Canon's had pixel shift for four years. Go on. Well, okay, so the Nikon Z <laughs> not well, no, the ZF actually had pixel shift, and now the Z9 and the Z8 have pixel shift. The ZF is the new little hipster camera, right? Ironic, right? Like, yeah. why would that camera have pixel shift when no one's going to be using it on a tripod? You know, it's a very bizarre. So, that, so they, well, they're, they're probably just testing it out to make sure it doesn't suck before they try it on a bigger camera. They try it on the like the shitty like hipster version, so that like, <laughs> where they know that no one's going to look at the technical aspects of the camera because they're just buying it for their kids. The Nikon the, the, the Nikon, <laughs> Nikon X100. I, I can't I can't talk bad about the ZF because it's a hot camera and there's a lot of like there's a lot of people using it who aren't like six years old, so I can't. I can't it actually that way. looks like a cool camera. It it looks like a Nikon F uh, FM three A. Yeah, Canon should do something like that. But anyway, well, except I, Canon doesn't have weather sealed lenses uh, that are small. Like all the Canon lenses that are weather sealed are the size of softballs. Yeah, which kind of is stupid. That's one where that's one where Fuji is absolutely better and superior than Canon. Is yeah. hey, we're gonna make small lenses that can get rained on. Yeah, no kidding. Sorry, I didn't mean to sidetrack you from no. your Nikon uh, extravaganza. I, 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 I didn't. Your blueprint for what the porn industry is going to use to not have to hire cameramen anymore. <laughs> There's so many functions for it, um, but no. Okay, I want to talk more about the pixel shifting. So what what makes this really cool is that you can stack four images on top of each other, and you'll get a a much higher RGB color accuracy out of the sensor. Now, obviously, this is something where you don't want a lot of movement, otherwise it's not going to track the pixels so well. But if you're a landscape photographer, if you're if you're an astro photographer, or if you're just if you're shooting automotive and you're shooting on tripods and you're like doing longer shutter speeds to kind of absorb as much pixel data as possible, this is going to be extremely helpful for you, where you don't have to do those high shutter speeds. Um, you can you can just yeah you can shoot at a regular shutter speed like one five hundredth, one two fifty of uh, of a second. And, and still get that, uh, that same saturation of your sensor by stacking images on top of each other. So 
if you have a bunch of pixels, you've got a mountain range and you've got like, you know, obviously the color right out of camera is great. You stack four of those on top of each other, any sort of like pockets of color that are lacking, there's going to be that, um, that full, uh, accuracy of subsampling based, based on the highest, um, oh my gosh, the based on the most effectiveness that the sensor could possibly be, but you're just basically maximizing your sensor out at that point. You know what camera has that? Canon? Well, VR5. yes. So does this? Yes, it does. But so does the Fuji GFX. Does it really? Yeah. Think about how large those files are. Does it stack in camera? Because uh, the Nikon doesn't stack in camera. I actually don't know the answer to that because I don't use that feature. Because I shoot people. I'm assuming it does, but I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I, I I I don't actually. You know, I don't think it does. I have to. You know, I'm gonna put the answer below because I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, and like to, to talk more about the data and like the quality of the image itself is um, at 32 stacked images, it gets up to 180 uh, megabyte photo. So it's it's a big, chunky, delicious photo. And the zoom in, like being able to zoom in, it's it's fantastic. I got to do another flex. Do you know how much, do you know how many megabytes <laughs> one photo is on my GFX? Bro, okay, your GFX, <laughs> your GFX is like a Panzer tank. It's slow and powerful. But that GFX 2, that's what I'm I'm interested in. I'm interested in seeing the autofocus capability on well, that GFX 2. I'm going to WPPI next week, and Fuji will be there. And if they have a GFX 102, I will, uh, I will try it out. And... Uh, I will tell you that Fuji actually, and this is just a little side tangent on Fuji, I think Fuji's tracking is actually very good. It's what happens after the tracking as to why Fuji lacks. So, And then uh, you know, all of a sudden you press your shutter release and it's like, oh, I'm going to throw this out of focus. You, 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 well, no, I give you a manual focus. Oh yeah, God. that's right. We did, we, for those of you who are new to this pod, this we did a so swap bad. episode where I surprised Brandon and I gave him my GFX and a Mamiya RB67 manual focus lens and said, go take pictures with this. It was the, it was the biggest dick move I've ever pulled on Brandon. So let me add some context to that situation. We were, we were at a model shoot meet and greet where I was meeting a whole bunch of people I'd never shot before. And they were expecting quality images um, from that shoot. And Kevin gives me this, this like, what, five-pound, like, contraption. <laughs> and if, if you don't know how uh, a Mamiya RB67 lens focuses with all the adapters going to Fuji, it's not just a single focusing ring with a medium format sort of, like, slim depth of field. Kevin gave me a manual beveling system to focus. It wasn't a regular focus. It was a beveling system. So the, the focus was incredibly sharp. And if I wasn't holding onto that ring, I could knock the focus out and it would a little bit would knock it so much that the whole like screen went black. What do you mean the aperture? Well, the aperture, yeah. Well, the, yeah, the, the aperture, aperture is a little ring. Yeah, so like uh, if you're used to using uh, old school you know, leaf shutter cameras, you'd have a stepped aperture ring and, you know, you oh, I click from five, six, and then it'd be like in third stop increments. Well, the photo deox adapter I gave him was just a variable. And it was like, it wasn't like a 270 degree throw. It was like a 10 degree throw from, from F32 to like F, uh, what is that? Like it was, it was like, it, it was like, boom, it was like, boom. Yeah, F2, 10 degrees F30, would get you through the entire F2, range. F2, F30, F2, F30. It was ridiculous. It, it was awesome. Um, and, yeah, but, it, was a, it was a great prank I played on Brandon. He still got a couple of usable pictures, but only a couple. <laughs> Barely. Barely. Yeah, but, I, I, I wasn't much better because you gave me your Z6, which, uh, hey, uh, if you ever want to get someone to not like Nikon, like, here, try to focus with this autofocus camera, and you'd be like, oh, my God. I gave Kevin the Z6 where um, the focusing point was the smallest setting it could possibly have, which may, makes it the most difficult to focus. So I basically gave Kevin a mirrorless um, hunting machine where like every time he tried to focus, it was it, it, it hunted. Uh, it definitely hunted and it definitely missed. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> but but to end to end commentary on the latest firmware update, something else uh, that's really exciting for people who shoot video on Nikon like we're doing right now is the N-Log uh, minimum ISO setting has been changed to a low ISO uh, mode where shooting N-Log now you can shoot at 200 ISO instead of 800 ISO. It's taking me forever to like get ideas out of my head today. But it yeah. happens. You yeah. got to you got to have another one of these uh, like one of these iced americanos. 
So Yeah, but yes, so instead of shooting 800 where you'd need an ND filter on a bright day because you don't want to stop down to F30, um, now you can shoot at ISO 200 and really save that depth of field if you really wanted to. Um, of course, on bright days, you will probably still have to use an ND filter. We're not in the zone where that's kind of something that technology is going to overcome. Um, but I, ISO 200 definitely gives you a lot more clarity versus 800 when you're shooting log on video. Awesome. Well, when we get back, when we come back, uh, we're going to talk about some stuff I'm anticipating coming out from Canon. We're going to talk about some uh, new releases of film stocks, and then we're going to talk about me going to WPPI next week. I'm pleased to announce that I'm launching three Capture One style packs, Metamorphic Portraits, The Sound of Silver, and Rangefinder. These will eventually also be available for Lightroom, so if you go to kevindealphotography.com, scroll to the bottom of the homepage, and join my mailing list, I promise I won't send you spam, but I will let you know the second these release. And now, on to today's episode. Hey, this is Malika Gradic, and you're listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. All right, we are back, and uh, I want to talk about some stuff that's uh, being anticipated from Canon. So apparently Canon is coming out with two new cameras this year, two big stills cameras this year. Apparently there's rumors they're coming out with new cinema cameras, which wouldn't surprise me, uh, but they're also coming out uh, supposedly with two uh, new stills cameras. Uh, if I'm lucky, if we're all lucky, maybe they'll announce it before WPPI, but the rumor is they're gonna announce in April. Uh, one of them, I, I do expect both of them for different reasons. So. Uh, one of them, they're looking to announce the Canon R1, which is going to be their flagship camera, which will be the response to uh, what is the new Sony camera that just came out? Uh, the A9 or the A1? A1? Well, Sony did some weird stuff. So, like, the A1 is their flagship camera still, but the, was it the A9 III or whatever it is is the one with the global shutter, but it's not. It's not as good as the A1, so I, I'm not a Sony guy. So you can tell me about it in the comments below. But <laughs> that's how I that's how that's how I anticipated. You you actually Kevin brought up to me the other day. He actually had a terrible experience uh, shooting Sony files or editing Sony files. For I, I did have a terrible experience editing Sony files. Uh, uh, yeah, wasn't wasn't a lot of fun. I don't understand the way that they do the colors. Uh, but you know, I know people who shoot on Sony who do great photography. So clearly, I'm the issue, not the not the files. But I did let you see the files, and you you had the same reaction that I did, and you were like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> yeah, they, were, they must have been shooting on like hyperlog gamma or something. It was I don't know what it was, but there was some weirdness going on with the colors. Uh, but so the A, oh, I'm sorry, the A1, the 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 R1. I can speak English. Canon supposedly is coming out with an R1 by the Olympics, which makes sense because that's the vibe. It's the Olympic camera. Apparently it's going to shoot, and this is all rumors and all, you know, you know how rumors are, but 240 frames per second. What's the point? Like, like what, like the only people who are going to be using it are professionals. And like, does a professional need 240 frames per second? That's 10 times faster than cinema, like frames per second. Yeah. Like, I don't understand why. You, I mean, like, I don't get it, but Hey, whatever. I don't, I don't know. Like, Tell me about it in the comments below. Tell us about it in the comments below. Why do you need 240 frames per second? If that's even a thing, um, uh, there have been back and forth on the the sensor for it. Like I've seen it go as high as 80 something and as low as in the 20s, which means that people really don't know. I remember watching a Peter McKinnon episode about seven eight years ago that like the the Canon DX Mark Mark One or Mark Two or whatever the hell like they're the One D the One D Mark Mark Two Mark One or Mark Two like. That shoot at 240 frames a second, and there's like... Did it? Yeah, I believe one of them did, and Peter McKinnon did a review on it, and that's why he loves it so much, is because he was able to do that at like 4K. I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't remember, because I I be I've never been able to afford one of those. It could have been 120 at 4K. I could be totally wrong there. Um, uh, well, yeah, but this is like stills, apparently. I don't oh, know. you're talking about like stills, like... Apparently, like I've, I've, that's what I've been seeing online. I'm like, what? What is this crap? Is anyway, it, Is it compressed or uncompressed? I don't even know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We can make up whatever we want because Canon rumors that there's just some guy in a basement in his mom's basement who's like, I heard from a reliable source that this could be happening. And so it might. Okay. And enough. then, you know, but but I, I, I do think that it's going to come out. I don't, I don't think that 
that's that groundbreaking that, that an R1 would come out in time for the Olympics because I think, frankly, it has to. Just like another camera that Canon, in my opinion, frankly, has to come out with, and that is the R5 Mark II, which is the one I'm worried, concerning myself with. And a lot of people listening to this are like, or watching this are like, well, I don't need an R5 Mark II, and you're probably right. You probably don't. But uh, I think Canon rushed the video stuff out early on it. I think they're like it had good video specs, but it didn't necessarily have good video execution. Um, and it's a little long in the tooth uh, there already because video specs are outdated in like five minutes in this world. Uh, but uh, I think because the Z8 came out and some other cameras came out that Canon kind of has to, and they also kind of forced their hand because they came out with the R6 Mark II. Now, when they originally released the R5 and the R6, they released them at the same time. Well, they've had an R6 Mark II out for like six, seven months now. So I think they are going to come out with a new uh, version of the R5 Mark II uh, because it's not even about like current owners. It's about future owners. Like if I'm a photographer and I'm like, should I go Nikon? Should I go Sony? Or should I go Canon? What do all three systems have to offer? Well, if you're offering up the R5 in its current version at almost $4,000, and then I look at what the Z8 has at $4,000, and I look at what Sony has uh, with their cameras at the similar price point, does that push me over to Canon? And for a lot of people who are new to the system, the answer may very well be no. Now, I already own an R5, so uh, the only way I'm going to get pushed into an R5 Mark II is if they come out with some really like good stills features that push me over the edge. Although, because I'm shooting more video stuff for YouTube, the video features could push me over the edge, but uh, it just depends. I mean, the nice thing for Canon is that they get to go last. So they can go, oh, well, Nikon's done this. Let's not release it yet. Let's fix this one thing. And, you know, that's that's actually the nice thing about not going first. Usually Sony goes first. Usually Sony's like, we're going to push the tech and make you the guinea pig, so to speak. Yeah. And then, and then Canon and Nikon react. And in this case, uh, Nikon had their Z8 first. Although Canon did come out. I mean, guess, I guess technically Canon was ahead of Nikon when the R5 originally came out. They, they had the better product in my opinion but if we're and i'm not talking about subjective things like what do you think about the colors and all that i'm just talking about if you look at the list of features i do think the z8 is a superior camera now to my r5 which is why i'm excited because they're probably going to come out with a new r5 soon you know I, I spent this whole time thinking about sony and why i just could never shoot on a sony and i'm just like you know i'm not a big camera beef guy but I like Canon. I like the way colors are produced out of Canon. Um, Nikon, I love I love the sort of flat profile that Nikon's known for. Um, they're actually improving that with a rich portrait mode color profile, probably be, to compete with Canon because Canon is known for just such rich, uh, great colors, yeah, even in RAW. Um, but I'm just so glad I'm not a, a Sony guy because it is such an, just a terrible system. I hate the way their photos look. And every well, time I see a photo taken on Sony, I know that it's a Sony photo because I just just I just know the way the light, the gradient of light is captured on that sensor. It is such a like hallmark look. And that's they've, it's like they've cornered themselves into into a specific like idea there. Well, and, and I think that that's the love or hate it type of mentality you could have for Sony. I think Fuji is the same way, although Fuji, in my opinion, they have all those different film simulations, so at least you have variation of it. Right. But Fuji has a look. That's one of the things that makes me gravitate toward Fuji. Uh, I've just never... I've just never really liked Sony. I've tried Sony. I don't like the way they feel. I don't like the menus. The I don't menus. like the colors. Uh, but I'm not talking shit about Sony because I know people who shoot on Sony who take great pictures and good for them i just happen to not be one of them i just don't like the way i don't like the way the files edit when i throw it like i just I, I feel like my starting point is just off i don't know that's all that's all i can say um i'll i'll, I'll make myself the problem it's me it's not you sony it's me and that's fine because i have something no, for no me. i'm the problem as well i just don't like it you yeah. know what i mean <laughs> so there's there's that right there right on well uh, so back to the, back to the point I was making though, is, uh, upcoming tech in 2024, I'm looking forward to, I do think that Canon is going to announce at least the R1, maybe the R5 Mark II. Although I keep seeing all these things that say that, oh, the R5 Mark II is tied to like the Olympics. It's like, why would, it, what the hell does that have to do with the Olympics? It has nothing to do with the Olympics, but I'll talk more about, uh, rumored specifications on the R5 Mark II in my episode, uh, that's actually coming out right before this episode because we're releasing this episode after I release my audio only R5 episode. So I'm not going to dive too much into the rumored specifications and all that, but that episode's going to talk about 
the original R5, what I love about the original R5, uh, how it's impacted the photography community. And then we talk about not necessarily the rumors of the R5 Mark II, but we're going to talk about what we want to see in the R5 Mark II, and we'll see if those rumors come true. So uh, so that's enough talk about Canon rumors and, and all that fun stuff and what we anticipate to see in 2024. But uh, let's uh, shift gears to uh, talking about film. Because uh, yeah. I know that there are some new film stocks that you want to talk about. Uh, why don't you talk about both of them right here, right now? So, yeah, um, something exciting in the 35 millimeter community here is uh, there's two new film stocks that have come out. One of the older ones is the Phoenix 200, which uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But first and foremost, I want to talk about the Ferrania. So Ferrania just came out with their P33. Uh, P, I'm assuming, stands for panchromatic, which means that Every frequency of color is accounted for in shifting that image to black and white. So basically, uh, you're going to have a pretty accurate color spectrum. Like if you have a dark red, it's going to be a darker gray when it changes to black and white. If you have a light yellow, it's going to remain light. Uh, whereas if you use like an ortho uh, orthochromatic film, it's uh, there's going to be variance there. You, you might have a light yellow that turns out to be a darker gray or just a medium gray and light the the lightness of the color doesn't translate. Um, but moving forward, what's exciting about this film is because um, it's, it's likely that most of you uh, have never heard of this. It's likely that most of you may have seen this on a film shelf in in your state or in your city and you just never really like considered using it. Uh, but that's why I want to bring up these film comparisons because I think it's incredibly exciting, especially for a film that's only eleven dollars per roll, which in this day and age is about middle, you know, middle of the road, maybe high middle of the road. For for black and white, I'd say that's high middle of the road. Are you talking about? Are you talking about for medium format, like one twenty? Are you talking uh, about thirty five? Thirty five. Oh, okay, that's actually that's actually pretty average for thirty five. Yeah, because you have more shots. So those, those is that twenty four or thirty six shots? So this is thirty six. Okay, oh, yeah, eleven dollars for thirty six. That's actually pretty pretty good. Yeah, and it's at a, it's at an ISO one sixty. So something I wanted to point out now. It, this isn't like super crazy, um, but it's worth mentioning. So when you compare the Ferrania to the Cine Still Double uh, uh, XX, it's no surprise that okay we've got more dynamic range here because. Clearly, we, uh, I think we all know at this point that the double X Cine Still Black and White is meant to be a moodier, contrastier film. However, when you compare the Ferrania P33 with, with Ilford FP4, which is 125, you'll notice that it has a nicer uh, dynamic range in the shadows. And it's noticeably, uh, it, it, it's just very, it's very pleasant compared to Ilford FP4 at 125. You can see how well it competes with another film stock that is known for fine grain and great dynamic range in the shadows. I'm a big Ilford guy, but my least favorite Ilford film stock is FP4. Really? Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a Delta and an HP5 guy. I personally am an HP5 guy for sure. But yeah, FP4 has always just been like too dark in the blacks or something. For it, me. Yeah, it's just it's just a little rougher looking. Uh, whereas I found that your mid tonal stuff on Delta is r that's what I love. And if I do want it to be a little punchier and obviously have more latitude, then that's what that HP5 is for. I always find the FP4 is the odd man out for me. Yeah, I never I never use the FP4. But I have a bunch sitting in my fridge and it just sits there. Maybe we'll give it away to somebody. Uh, we'll do a giveaway for the pot or something. Yeah. yeah. That way it goes to a loving home. I love how I'm trying to show a comparison between the P33 and the FP4, and we both basically came to the conclusion that we never use the FP4. But it is a, it is a great way to test basically. Well, I like I like the way that the Farina. I like the way that the P33 looks better. Yeah, it's it's got a nicer. It's, it's just got more detail. So normally I wouldn't care about uh, a new film coming from Ferrania because they're not exactly the most known film stock out there. Um, but what is really interesting is to see, okay, how does it, how does it stand with uh, some of Ilford's stocks? And it, it does seem to have uh, a really, really great output for what it is. I would like to see it compared to HP5, to be honest. I, I would like to see how it works versus that. Yeah, Basically. yeah, same here. Uh, but the the shot of the the shot of the model the the woman I much preferred the shot that was on the left earlier I thought it was better so uh, speaking of Ilford don't they have a new film stock that just came out or is it so it's it's Harmon I'm trying to find uh, the I'm trying to find the photos here Harmon which don't they 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 make Ilford I think Ilford is like the specific I don't know I don't know what the difference is. Yeah, we should have had Andy Famine here for that one. So, so basically, yeah. So here I've got some comparisons. 
Um, Harmon's basically released uh, their first color film stock in a long time. I don't know what the exact year is, but it's called Phoenix. It's an ISO 200 uh, 35 millimeter 36 photo film stock. Uh, I've recently shot a roll of this. I actually have to go pick it up from the camera store here pretty soon. But it's 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 an incredibly warm cast film. Um, I'm looking at looking at some examples here. So it's it's incredibly high grain. It's it's not going to be really uh, something that's going to be very flattering. You wouldn't take landscape photos of it like in any serious matter. Um, but it's meant to have really punchy, warm shadows, punchy, warm midtones, and punchy, warm highlights. Um, it's kind of like a Lamography style film where you're not going to be buying this for its color accuracy. You're not going to be really buying it for any sort of high qualityness. It's just it's kind of Ilford saying, "Hey, we're in the we're in the color game. You know us for color now. It might not be the best, but damn it, we're here." Well, I think the Harmon stuff is like their. I mean, when it just says Harmon on it, it doesn't say Ilford. It's cheaper. Yeah, yeah, that's probably yeah, that's probably correct. So, um, but uh, I don't know. It's a cool looking film stock. Uh, it's it's. I'm I'm pretty boring when it comes to film stocks. Not very experimental at all. Everyone's like, "Hey, Kevin, what's your favorite film stock?" Portrait Four Hundred. Oh, okay. <laughs> what's your second favorite? Although I do piss them off sometimes because I shoot Ektar sometimes. But like That's my favorite film stuff. stocks uh, are black and white. Uh, Tri-X, T-Max, just Delta. Like I'm very, I'm very run of the mill because reliable. I can't, I can't find anything better. And and then and then I'll see like these little uh, one-off esoteric film stocks where you pay twenty dollars and it looks weird. And the colors are all messed up, That's and you terrible. go, you, "What do you What do you do? You take them into post, and you start messing with the colors." It's like, well, the whole point of shooting a film stock is to shoot that film stock to take care advantage of its characteristics. If I don't like its characteristics, I'm not using the right film stock. Yeah, no kidding. And to be honest, like, uh, I brought this. I don't. I don't know why I brought this up, but it's like I don't know where I would use this film stock at. I know exactly where I would use the P33 from Ferrania, but this film stock is kind of like. It's really rough around the edges. Like it, it leaves a lot to be desired. Yeah, I don't know, man. It's it's interesting. Like if if you know where I would use that, and it it's probably not going to ever happen. Is if somebody gave me a mood board that looked like that. <laughs> like all right, uh, you gave me a mood board that uh, like oh my gosh, like I can't see. Uh, go back up right there. Is that is that like insane? It, like it halation, looks, that's crazy and bloom halation effect going on there right now. Oh my god! Like that is, yeah. That that looks yeah. like when you take it into dehancer and you like take that slider and just peg it over. It looks like and, digitally enhanced halation. Yeah, that looks pretty hardcore. Uh, but yeah, so that's uh, okay. So if you want to take all the weird quirkiness of film and just uh, you know, I think the reason it looks so bad is because it doesn't look like film. It looks like a digital version. It looks like it like it looks a, like somebody. It looks like really bad film simulations. Yeah, or like when Instagram released their first filter pack in like 2012 or whatever. It looks like that kind of like quirky film photo look, not even like a real film photo look. Yeah, because in my opinion, like I mean, gosh, the, yeah, but like those highlights are just yuck. I mean, I would rather when I look at you know you know what that makes me want to do that makes me want to go shoot Portrait Four Hundred, <laughs> like, like because because Portrait Four Hundred is so much more forgiving when you overexpose it like that. Yeah. It's like, hey, do you want your colors to pop even more? Oh, yeah. okay. Well, we'll we'll just we'll we'll shoot on Portrait Four Hundred and it'll look better. Yeah, those those look like those just look like ooh, like, yeah, <laughs> that's so gnarly. It, it's like. Uh, I don't know, like uh, I went to Disney World and you, you go into like the Small World ride and all like the all the like costumes are starting to wear after 45 years <laughs> and it just like the colors are starting to fade out. That's like the film equivalent of like the Small World ride that needs to be updated. It's so yeah. bizarre. It looks like 50 year old film. It like this is all shot within the last four months and yet it looks like it's been dated for so long. So are you looking forward to this? You, you just shot it, right? I just shot it on a big hiking trip. We summited a uh, a peak at Big Bend National Park, and I took a lot of photos of my brothers in the wilderness during 
bright sunny days. So, I, so, so, so you're anticipating this to look really terrible. This is going to look awful. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at it now. So, it's going to so look it's terrible. Like, it's like all the things that, that, that we just said don't do. Like don't shoot landscapes on it. Brandon <laughs> shot landscapes on it. Uh, don't shoot in the middle of the day. Well, if you've ever been to Big Bend, all that limestone and all that, like with the crazy highlights blowing out, sounds like you're going to have some really, sh- you're going to have 36 really shitty frames is what it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, every now and again, you put film into your 35 millimeter film camera and you just don't care. You just assume that, oh, because it's film in my camera, this is just going to look nostalgic and fun. You, your <laughs> thinking cap is off, you're on vacation and you just do that. And now that I'm looking at the actual results on the the, the internet, this is, this is not going to look good. This is going to look terrible. This is going to go in a Google Drive somewhere and I'm going to view it about once a year and never do anything with it right on well i want to shift gears to something that i'm working on Ooh, what's uh, over there so first and foremost uh i'm a you i have a i have a youtube channel uh oh it, it just uh why does it want me to sign into my intuit account sorry folks all right so i have a youtube channel uh that i run in addition to this channel and uh, I do gear reviews, and I have a lot of companies who reach out to me from from China uh, who want me to review their lenses. And there's this company called Brighton Star, and they have a 50 millimeter 0.95. That's that's. I mean, we all know that this is going to be chromatic aberration hell, but you can't you can't pass up the opportunity. Uh, at reviewing a 0.95 lens. So uh, the best part about this whole website. Is their uh, their English? So uh, yeah, uh, super large aperture auroras. Okay, cool. I don't know what that means. Integrated light shield, moral experience. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. <laughs> no, this bad. is the best part. This is the best part. They want to call it the Eye of the Night God. So yes, the Eye of the Night God. And you know what though? Happy Chinese New Year. You, you know what though? I'm, I'm, it sounds like I'm making fun of them and from for their English translator, I am. But I've noticed that a lot of these quirky lenses that come from China actually do some really cool stuff. Like I've, TT Artisan has reached out to me. I've gotten some really great results with that. It's going to be a manual focus lens. I, I told him, I was like, hey, I'm going to Vegas next week. If you want to give me a 0.95 a, a maximum aperture lens, this is the time to do it because I can go to like Fremont street and see all the sketchy characters out there and get some good bouquet at 0.95 with a 50 mil. I'm hoping that happens. Uh, that's one of the things I've been up to, uh, but we're, we're kind of shifting gears into the WPPI show uh, and some new, uh, some new stuff that's coming out. Uh, I'm also going to be testing out this guy right here. Uh, the a one from Aparo. Now, I've done a lot of reviews of LED lights. Uh, one of the reasons why this LED light stands out to me is it actually uses magnetic charging, which is cool. It's an RGB light, and then it has these skins you can put over it for diffusion. And so I'm like, oh, I'll take that with me out there, and I'll try to use it as a video light, and I think that'll be cool. Uh, but some other new product announcements that, that are, are of note is that Profoto just announced uh, – where let me see if I can find it. They just announced a new – a softbox setup uh, that folds up and like all pro photo stuff, it's massively overpriced. So $449 for a strip softbox. Um, I love pro photo. I use pro photo. <laughs> I think that their lights are a little overpriced, but they're good lights where I draw the line on pro photo is in their modifiers. As a matter of fact, if you go check out pro photos, click modifiers, uh, this specific one right here, the Click Octabox, that is the exact same modifier as this Angler for half the price. And they're made in the exact same factory in South Korea. Uh, they actually, I've actually seen videos on it, and they're the exact same thing. It's just one has a Profoto logo on it, one doesn't have a Profoto logo on it. And uh, my reaction to not purchasing uh, this Profoto softbox for 449 is, is you can get the same thing from a cheetah, cheetah stand for $176 with a pro photo clamp and all that. Now, does it break down as much? No. Am I going to talk to cheetah stand next week to see if they can make something similar? Yes. <laughs> cause, cause it's just like, that's the one place where like I draw my line on, on pro photo is just so it's like the, the modifiers are way overpriced. Yeah. Interjecting on a completely tangential idea they should make a Google extension where when you're about to buy something on Amazon, wherever, they show you other options that are sourced from the same exact factory. 
That so, would be hard to track, but I would love to see them do it because well, it's all coming out of Shenzhen and Guangdong, Guangdong, China. So although, although uh, Pro Photo and Angler make theirs in South Korea, so okay. But which South Korea makes good stuff. I mean, uh, in general, like so, I'm not, I, I'm not shitting on the quality of the Pro Photo modifiers. I'm just saying that you can get the exact same modifiers with a different logo on them for half the price. It's not that they're bad modifiers. It's just that you can get similar modifiers for the for half the price yeah and and at the end it, of the day the color difference is going to be most photographers can't even tell let alone clients <laughs> so you're, well the no reason gonna know. the reason why i want to harp on so much that they are the exact same materials because if you hear somebody say oh well the pro photo modifiers are better built that is bullshit because they're the same exact modifiers they're built in the same factory the only thing that's different on their click modifier is they they change the handle up versus the angler but if you look at if you put both of those uh, soft boxes in your hand, they're the same soft box, literally the same, same material, everything. Oh, their spokes are black and the other ones are white. Like that's not that, that's not a quality difference. It's a color difference. So that's not that's, that's not, a that's a hell of a good YouTube video. Just buy a bunch of soft boxes that are built from the same factory and test them side by side, shot for well, shot. Oh, uh, uh, Marcus Picks has done that. That, the guy Marcus picks who has the bunker in his uh, in his his California compound. Yeah. He's done that, and he's shown he's shown like Cheetah versus Glow versus Pro Photo, and he's shown you there's no difference. And and it's you know to me uh, the only reason I would purchase one modifier over another and pay more for it is if it's a better built modifier. Now there are examples of that Bronze Color modifiers are amazing modifiers. That's also why they have a comma on the price tag. But uh, for yeah. something that I'm going to go beat the hell out of on location, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just not that dude. Like, I, I don't have I don't have a twenty eight hundred dollar budget for my softbox. I like Carl Taylor does. Yeah, yeah. Divide that by ten. That's about where I hang. Maybe even divide that by twenty, and that's about where yeah. I hang. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so I'm going to WPPI next week. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing some new things that have come out. So. Uh, obviously Fuji. I'm looking forward to going to Fuji's booth. I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely do some interviews with Fuji if I can pull that off. I think I think I can land Fuji. I don't think I can land Nikon. I don't think I can land Canon. Uh, I don't. I'm not gonna be going by Sony's booth. So if you're a listener, or if you're, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I may I may go by and, and and film like, hey, here's their new stuff or whatever. I, I, you know what? That's not true. If if Sony has that new, what is it, A9 Mark III with the global shutter. I am going to go check that out. That would be interesting. Uh, that would yeah. be interesting. Um, I, I am going to go check that out. Uh, but when you look at the list of people who are going to be at WPPI, um, you know, they're, they're going to be there. Uh, Imagine is going to be there, which if you're not familiar with Imagine, they do the uh, the – basically you can edit a wedding in 10 minutes. Oh, where, they're, they're where it software. uses artificial intelligence to learn your 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 Lightroom techniques. So I'm, yep. I'm going to stop by that booth. Uh, Godox is going to be there. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of flash companies who are going to be there. So to the person who said that flash is dead, apparently they're still exhibiting at booths. So uh, at trade shows. <laughs> so I guess Flash isn't dead because they can afford to spend ten thousand yeah. dollars on a booth. Yeah, which Flash are you looking to uh, looking to audit here? Uh, you know, I think I want to stop by the Stella Pro booth because I, I originally uh, I, they they came out with a new light and I ordered it on like Black Friday and it just never came so I just canceled my order. Yeah, so I just canceled my order. So, oh shit! Okay. Yeah, but I want to go stop by and and I want to I want to I want to <laughs> see if I can interview them. Talk to them about the order. <laughs> no, no, no. They 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 were cool. They they're like yeah we we were, we're they they apologized so I'm not throwing them under the bus. They're actually. From all my interactions with them, they're a stand-up uh, professional company. It was just I didn't want my money to be tied up for two or three months, you know, for something that didn't say it had a back order, you know. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, I understand that in the case of my well, that was the other thing is they charged my card. Like when I bought my X one hundred six from B and H, they're they're not charging me till it ships. Right. Whereas in the case with uh, with the Stella thing, it was like twelve hundred dollars. I paid my bill off. My credit card bill in full, and I said, "Think, son, ship." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't, kind of want that. Yeah, money kind of, kind of want that money back." So, uh, uh, but I have my budget, my my WPPI budget for. So, for all you know, I'll be coming back with one of their lights. How do you? You're gonna come back with more than that. I know. I know you are. We'll see. Well, one thing I am gonna be coming back with, and I'll talk about this right now, is I'm gonna come back with a new backpack because. I got this backpack right here in 20 
it, it's funny. I, I I always say that. You know, I buy all this gear, but the one thing you should never ask me for advice on is a backpack because I've never been happy. I, I I guess that's technically true, but I've had this backpack since 2017. It's a USA Gear backpack, uh, and it's it's getting long on the tooth. You can see that the lining is starting to come out. Now, it's six years old now, so it's served its per – I think six years out of a backpack that you use every day is actually worth it. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, I keep my – air tag right here so that's a pro tip uh, you cut out the lining you put your air tag in uh and you know if somebody steals your backpack at least you can find your backpack yeah uh, you can't find your camera if they've already pawned it but it gives you a little bit of critical time to uh to figure that out but yes this bag uh has served me well but it's time to retire it uh, I think I told the story about how uh, I broke my 70 to 200 because I was tired and I had the side compartment open and I just put the backpack <laughs> on and my 70 to 200 in the middle of Santa Fe, New Mexico and the Fairfield Inn parking lot just went boom and yeah, destroyed my 70 to 200. I, I don't like side compartments. I don't like backpacks with multiple compartments. That's my takeaway from this backpack. Uh, additionally, it's been very hard to zip up some of these uh, zippers now. They're getting caught. So... Uh, that is something I'm planning on walking away with, uh, at WPPI is a brand new backpack. I see that, uh, what, what is, what is Peter McKinnon? Doesn't Peter McKinnon have a backpack company? He's uh, got so many companies. He's no, got a, Nomadic, uh, isn't that his back? That sounds like. Yeah. It. Nomadic is going to be there. I so maybe I'll stop by their booth. Filters. Uh, Tamron's going to be there. Uh, so I'd love to see if maybe Tamron has some new lenses coming out maybe for Fuji. Uh, and, and I guess they're coming out with stuff for Nikon now too. Um, doesn't doesn't Nikon have like some sort of a, maybe I'm thinking Sony? There's like a f2 lens that's like a really long range for that system. I don't remember what it was. It's kind, it's kind of like a 24 to 70 ish type uh, lens. But I'm definitely gonna go buy Photo Deox's booth because uh, I've done some. Uh, I've done some sponsorship stuff with them. You know what I want to look at while I'm at WPPI is I want to look at backdrops, hand-painted backdrops. I'm going to see what's out there. Maybe see if someone will, will give us one. <laughs> that would be cool. Hey, I'll do a review. Uh, just give me a backdrop. So uh, it'll be fun. Zihoon's going to be there. I noticed that there are some, like, there are bays that are wide open. So, like, all these bays are just open. So I don't know if it's a smaller conference this year or if they haven't announced anybody. It looks like Adobe's going to be there. Uh, Newer's going to be there. Honeybook. Hobo Light. Uh, Hobo Light makes some interesting stuff. Have you ever seen Hobo Light stuff? Uh-uh. Uh, let me find it for you real quick. Yeah, Hobo Light. Uh, they look like oh, it helps. It. Oh, I've seen these. Yeah, here. I'll, I'll put it on your laptop. Yeah, they, they, they look like really cool. I mean, everything's not. The, the, their stuff is somewhat expensive, but it looks nice. It's it, that's weird. It, if, if Hasselblad were a light, that's so <laughs> bizarre. Yeah, it looks like the Crossley like uh, record player, where it like looks expensive, but like you don't know if it actually is. Yeah, although I keep seeing lighting companies, um, they keep going to these proprietary formats. Like you have to buy our softbox. You have to buy our. Uh, you have to buy our. Uh, what is it? Color temperature, orange gels. And it's like, you know, just, just keep making your stuff more universal. So I don't know if that's what they do. It looks like that's what they do, but I'm going to stop by their booth and check it out. So, um, anything else you want to talk about today? Anything you're anticipating, uh, as far as a new product? No, that pretty much covers it. I wish Hasselblad were there. They make that new CFV 100 C. Have you seen I, that thing? I saw that. Yeah. Hasselblad makes that, uh, I want to, uh, you know, it's something I'd never buy. It's, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the, uh, the X 106, but for people with way more money. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, it's, it's interesting because the actual body itself is basically, it's basically a square that's like four, three or four millimeters thick with a handle. And on that, on that square, it's got like a circle in the middle and you put the lens on one side of the circle and you put the film back, a digital film back on the other and it comes with a, a handle that slides on. So it's shaped like like an old Hasselblad, like 501 CM or whatever the hell they're called, um, but it's a digital camera. And so it's like, uh, I don't know why you would use it. It's kind of like, like, okay, I wouldn't use it to shoot models. I'd probably only use it to shoot landscapes and... Uh, based on Willem Verbeek's review of the camera, because he shoots medium format and he's one of the one of the best medium format uh, photographers, technically talented, I think that we have in our generation. Uh, so I saw him use it, and I was kind of just like, okay, if he's using it on a tripod and he's getting some like um, 
blue hour shots of LA in contrast with the mountains and the purple sky. Like I, I can see the use. I can see when you'd use that, you know, the megapixels and the quality, but like other than that, it's not, it's not known for its autofocusing and it's not really known for its like, uh, like usability. It's a touch screen, which I'd imagine could be a nightmare on the go. So I need to get my hands on one before I pass judgment, but for $8,200 for a body, uh, I could definitely see that. Uh, I, I could definitely, like, I, like I said, I think it kind of, to me, this is, of course, judging a book by its cover and not actually putting my hands on it. It kind of reminds me of what the X100, like, whole thing. Yeah, the whole X100 culture, but for people with more money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a medium format X100 culture, so to speak. But I've also seen, uh, Ma- you know, Manny Ortiz and other people say that they really love it. And so, I don't know. I should I, I, I should get my hands on one. Uh, House of Blood will never let me it's, test one out. But it, it's like uh, It's like people buy those cameras to use them. They don't buy them to take photos. They buy them to use the cameras. You know, it's like it's like the old saying, like an like a DJ uses equipment to play music. An audiophile uses music to play equipment. Well, some people buy those cameras just to take pictures of those cameras and go look at the camera that I have next to a <laughs> nice next to a nice latte as well. Yeah, oh, I'm so trendy. I spent twelve thousand dollars on a camera and a lens, and I don't even know how to compose a shot. Yeah. All right. Well. I think that that'll wrap it up for uh, our episode today. Uh, what are we on? Eight, nine, whatever. I'll put it down eight. at the bottom. Eight. Biocho. Season two, episode number eight. That does it for today's episode. Uh, we thank each and every one of you for sticking around. Our next episodes uh, that are going to be uh, recorded video-wise are going to likely be from the WPPI show. It'll be interviews. It'll be me uh, talking about new gear, fun stuff like that. So uh, do stick around for that if you're wanting to look at some of the new releases coming out from all the different uh, vendors. I'll be talking to them, and I'll be coming to you from WPPI. F11.pod, F11.com, F11pod.com, I can say it, is where you can find us. Until next time, chase light and not algorithms. Thank you for listening to today's episode. For more information about this podcast, go to www.f11pod.com.